What does God want me to do? What does God want me to do? The most frequent question I'm asked, in one way or another, in some shape or another, when people come into the office, that most of them come in struggling to discern what God's will is for their life. Hands down, 90% of those who sit down at the table with the pastor are not looking for my opinion or my conclusion. What they want is to hopefully believe that I might help them understand what God desires of them and what God wants them to do with a certain situation in their life. Come in asking, what does God want me to do? Come in saying that I have a desire in my heart, but how do I know if it's God's will or if it's just what I want to do. You come in at a crossroad, have a critical decision to make, and are wondering which path does God want me to walk on. They come in, they've been dating somebody for a long time, and they want to know, God, is this the one, or should we look for another? They come in with this curiosity and concern of trying to discern what God's will is for their life. My brothers and sisters, I would suggest to you that hands down the greatest struggle all of us face as we walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter how big your Bible is, no matter how many Sundays you come to church, all of us at some point in our lives struggle with trying to understand what is God's will? What does God want me to do? What decision is God backing? What road does God want me to take? What job has God put his finger on? What relationship has God endorsed? What does God really want? want me to do. Discerning the will of God for the decisions of your life is not always easy. Why? Because God doesn't always speak his will in grand and glorious ways that are easy to understand. Elijah, one of the greatest prophets of God, has prayed to the Lord for God to reveal his will to him. And in chapter 19 of 1 Kings, Elijah says that a wind blew, and the wind was so strong that it began to shake the mountains. But God wasn't in that wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, and the earth began to shake and tremble, but God wasn't speaking through the earthquake. And then there was a great and grand fire that consumed everything, but God wasn't speaking in the fire. And after the wind and after the earthquake and after the fire, there was a still, small voice. And what Elijah understood is what we understand is that God doesn't always speak in earth-moving, shattering signs and symbols that give you clarity into what God wants, that sometimes the will of God is spoken in a still, small voice. Wouldn't faith be easier if God revealed his will in big ways? I mean, it'd be easier if God just bought a billboard on your way to work and put up what your instructions were for your life. God doesn't even have a Facebook page, won't even post what he wants you to do. God doesn't tweet you in the morning with your divine assignment. God has never sent you an email. God no longer speaks through a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Wouldn't it be easier if when you prayed for God to reveal his will, he would make it easy to discern in grand and glorious ways. But God speaks in still, small voices. Somebody today, you're struggling to know what God wants you to do. How do I know what God wants me to do? You probably say, read the Bible. And that, that's a good answer. I endorse that. I, I second that motion. Because if you read your Bible, you will be a better Christian. However, the Bible does not always reveal to you God's personal prescribed providential plan for your life. The Bible tells me some things, but it does not always give me the personal decisions I need to make in my daily living. I can't go to the Bible, open it up, find a book with my name on it where God has written me a letter to tell me everything I must do every day of my life. So again, how do I know what God wants me to do? Well, part of discerning that will of God, I believe we can glean some insight through the journey of the Apostle Paul. Watch what the Bible says. Paul then determines 
that he wants to go to Asia, modern day Turkey. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit did not allow it. And so then Paul says, well, let me go to Bithynia. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit did not allow it. Make certain you catch this. When Paul wants to go to Turkey, the Holy Spirit says no. And when Paul wants to go to Bithynia, the Holy Spirit says no. Make sure you catch this, that when their heart's desire is to go this way, if that was not where God wanted them to go, the Holy Spirit is what God uses to keep them from going in the wrong direction. God uses the Holy Spirit to be that still, small voice that tells you what God wants you to do. That the Holy Spirit allows me to interpret the will of God around me so that when I am filled with the Holy Spirit, I can see and hear and discern what direction God is pointing me. And hear me, my brother and my sister. God is not trying to play a game with you. God's will, he does not want it to remain a mystery. God is not trying to keep his will out of your vision. God wants you to know what he wants you to do. He wants you to know his will. He wants you to be obedient. And he gives you the Holy Spirit to be able to discern it. So, when you read the Bible in your devotional life and you come away with an understanding of what God wants you to do, Holy Spirit. When you come to church confused and somewhere between the singing of the song and the preaching of the sermon, a light shines and you got it now, you understand it made sense in your heart and in your head, that wasn't a choir and it wasn't a preacher. Holy Spirit. When you sit down with your pastor, your counselor, your therapist, your psychiatrist, and you talk to them, and when you're done talking with them, you now believe that God has spoken to you and you know what you're supposed to do, don't give it uh, the credit to the PhD on the wall. That's the Holy Spirit. When you've been praying for God to direct you and you wake up one day and you see signs around you that begin to speak God's will over your life, your neighbor saw the same thing and didn't get anything out of it. Why? Because that's the Holy Spirit. That the role of the Holy Spirit is to direct you in God's will. Now, 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 if that's how God speaks through the Holy Spirit, that means that there are two things you've got to do in order to discern what God wants you to do in every decision you've got to make. Number one, you've got to bathe your decision in prayer. If you want God to talk to you, you better talk to him. Bathe it in prayer. God, tell me which way to go. God, make sure the motivations of my heart are correct. God, make your way clear to me. God, guide me. God, speak to my heart. God, point me in the right direction. That if you trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, he will what? God will direct your path when you bathe your decision making in prayer. You want to know why some of us have difficulty discerning God's will? You're on sensory overload. You got too much coming at you. Too much Facebook to sense God. Too much Twitter. Too much reality TV. You wonder why you can't discern the will of God when the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning is check your phone to read your emails, to see who tweeted you, how many new followers you got last night. And we're so overloaded with other things that we can't discern the will of God so that you can clearly hear the still, small voice of God. Now, wait a minute, somebody, I know you, I know you, I just heard it. You said, hold on, Reverend, I've been praying. God hadn't showed me anything. 
I've been praying sincerely for God to direct me, and God hasn't told me which path to take. God hasn't pointed out what I ought to do. God hasn't made it clear. You've been praying, but you still don't know. Okay, I want you to see what happens with Paul. Bible says, the Holy Spirit did not allow Turkey. The Holy Spirit did not permit Bithynia, but they got to Macedonia by their own conclusion. Now it's interesting that Bithynia was blocked by the Holy Spirit, Turkey was blocked by the Holy Spirit, but Macedonia, we're never given any indication that the Holy Spirit directed them to Macedonia. They got to Macedonia by their own conclusion, which means this, they discerned the will of God because what God didn't want them to do was clearer than what God did. Don't, don't lose me. God's no is always louder than God's yes. That what God does not want you to do, God is able to block clearly. But where God wants you to do comes to the conclusion and passion and moving in that direction and finding out in a real sense, they were able to discern the will of God, not through God's yes, but through the absence of God's no. Here's what happens. They try to go to Turkey and the Holy Spirit blocks it in some way. They try to go to Bithynia and the Holy Spirit blocks it in some way. They try to go to Macedonia and they conclude that Macedonia must be the right direction because there was no blockage or interference from the Holy Spirit. And since God did not say no, that must be the direction God wanted them to go in. That sometimes we discern the right road because God keeps the door open. He hear me, there's one passage of scripture I really, 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 really want you to memorize. It, it, it's one of the most prophetic promises in all of scripture and it's one that we don't hang our hat on enough. It comes to us in Revelation chapter three and verse seven when Jesus says this, I can close a door no man can open and I can open a door no man can close. That we serve a God who is able to shut down the wrong road and open up the right road. God can block and prevent you from moving in the wrong direction and God can swing wide open the door that leads you down the right path. So here's what you do. You bathe it in prayer and then you move in the direction that you feel you ought to go and trust God enough that if that's not what he wants you to do, he can close the door that you'll never be able to open. And he'll leave open a door that no one can close, no matter how long it takes you to get there. If that's God's will, that door will always be open.